Kenny, Dumelang, Sambonani, and welcome to the Avrik podcast, a podcast that aims to bring clarity to the concept of violence and its consequences in the lives of victims and survivor groups, as well as the perpetrators and their descendants. In this episode, Dr. Anel Stacey Daris examines the history of physical education and sports science at Stellenbosch University. Dr. Daris traces the ways in which nationalism has been woven into the formation of university disciplines. This research was born out of controversy, accompanied by a strong undertow of intellectual and emotional unease. In March 2019, a Stellenbosch University study from its sports science department examining the cognitive functioning of colored women sent shockwaves through the country. Academics and the broader public alike expressed both shock and disgust at the study's findings. The most senior author tried to defend the article and argued that the project did not study intelligence, but rather um, specific higher functions of the brain. A petition signed by more than 10,000 people, both academic and lay, denounced the research. The article was retracted and the university rallied hosting conversations on a formal and informal level to try and find out what had gone wrong. I see when news of this study broke, I was in the final year of my master's conducting research on Falkakunda and Falkakunda photography in Southern Africa, drawn in by the urge to understand why a study of this nature, one seeped in ideas of race essentialism, classism and sexism could have been published Almost 20 years into a new century, and in a post-apartheid dispensation, I embarked on this research. This study, based in a community that is not in any way different to my own, compelled me to examine the science behind this type of research and the history of the academic disciplines that facilitated it. In the wake of the controversy surrounding the 2019 article, Henry Walters, who is my respondent here today, contextualized the research premise and contended that this was, in fact, not an anomaly. At a colloquium following public reaction, the public's reaction, Stellenbosch Professor of Education, Jonathan Janssen, said, and I quote, I'm surprised that you're surprised, end quote. He alluded to the university's history of race science in various disciplines. Moreover, in writing from the standpoint of the sports science department and in direct response to that VEX 2019 article, Francois Cleofas, who was a senior lecturer at the Stellenbosch University Sports Science Department, asserted, and I quote, the sports science curriculum concerns itself narrowly with technologies of sports performance, giving little consideration to the role of ideology and politics in the field. The 2019 study makes the colored body central to the discipline's fixation on measurement. All this raises the question, how did the black body become a problem in the first place? In considering the aforementioned bodies of work, as well as the broader historiography that investigate the related fields, my research is situated within a complicated institutional history. In considering this, my study seeks to make sense of physical education later he imagined that sports science is fixation with bodily measurement and the scientification of the discipline. In doing so, my research reveals that the methodological impulse to measure was deeply rooted in ideologies of racial purity and preservation, as well as notions of nation building and the civilizing of the body. In reckoning with Stellenbosch University's institutional past, my research examines the theoretical, political, and social underpinnings of the, that informed the development of physical education and sports science from 1935 to 2019. In framing this investigation against the backdrop of Stellenbosch University, my research argues that the establishment and institutionalization of physical education was deeply political, and its rise and development was structured along nationalist lines. In using Stellenbosch as a lens through which to engage in the discipline's history, my study outlines the extent to which social, political and economic conditions dictated the trajectory of physical education. In framing this portion of today's seminar, I would like to turn to the work of Jonathan Janssen. So, according to Janssen, the process of evaluating the state of university curricula and syllabi 
illuminates the fact that knowledge is not merely something codified within specific subjects and disciplines, but instead should be deemed as the underpinning ideological, epistemological, and indeed political assumptions that inform the ethos of an academic institution. In locating the genus of physical education at Salambash University and tracing its theoretical and practical shifts, my research draws on Janssen's conceptualization and positions university curricula and syllabi as the building blocks of the university as a whole. So, formerly known as Victoria College, Stellenbosch University was awarded its university status over 100 years ago in April 1918. The institution's transition from college to university came about, among other reasons, but largely due to the result of the 1916 Universities Act as well as a generous legacy donation from local benefactor Jan Marais. As Folks Universiteit, which, trans, which loosely translates to People's University or the Nation's University, the institution offered white students, and this is from the University Centenary Celebration book, so um, the institution offered white students nationwide the chance to receive tuition in Dutch, and in English, as well as the opportunity to help develop an anchor of Afrikaans as a fully-fledged academic language. While the university catered for the educational needs of the broader white population in South Africa, the institution's core identity was intertwined with the history of Afrikaans nationalism. In outlining the university's place and purpose in the latter half of the 20th century, then-rector Hendrik Bernardus Storm stated, and I'll quote this in both Afrikaans and English, Die feit bly echt bestaan dat die Universiteit van Stellenbosch uit die nood van die Afrikaner gebore is. Um, which translates to the fact that remains that Stellenbosch University was birthed out of the need of the Afrikaner. Commending the extent to which the Afrikaner folk or nation contributed to the expansion of the university, Tom asserted that Stellenbosch University was created for and strengthened by the Afrikaner nation. Arguing that the university served as an exemplary beacon for the country, Tom stated that while Stellenbosch as an institution had its shortcomings, the university had an inherent responsibility to reciprocate the Afrikaner folk's investment by advancing its interests. This inherent desire to support the interests of the Afrikaner nation served as a core driver behind the introduction of physical education as an academic discipline at Stellenbosch University. Standardized physical education was implemented as an instrument to address the social political plight of the Afrikaner nation through the means of physical, mental, and moral optimization. In 2018, Stellenbosch University celebrated, or as the university term, commemorated its centenary. In the centenary address, the university's vice chancellor, Wim de Villiers, discussed the institution's past, present, and future. In emulating Stellenbosch University's Forward Together Sonke Sia Pambili Samforen to slogan, the Villiers foregrounded the university's many achievements. Beyond the focus on Stellenbosch University's triumphs, he sought to acknowledge the institution's past by calling for greater nuance regarding the assessment of the university's history. In arguing that the notion of Stellenbosch as the cradle of apartheid was a gross oversimplification, this address sought to paint a complex picture by acknowledging the university's affiliation both to staunch proponents of nationalism and segregation as well as prominent Afrikaner dissidents. Encapsulated within the call for nuance, Stellenbosch University's inability to escape or conceal its connections to South Africa's colonial, segregationist and apartheid past was highlighted as large sections of central campus stand tall over the ruins of the Flakta and Lukov School, which served as the first African secondary school for colored children in the Boerland. This call for new ones draws attention to the extent to which South Africa's dark history had been woven into the very architecture of this university. And considering the fact that while research for the aforementioned 2019 sports science article was most likely being conducted in the midst of the centenary celebration, it is imperative to interrogate Stellenbosch University's ethos whilst analysing the development of physical education and sports science as academic disciplines, because as we know, knowledge is not produced in isolation. An institution's culture dictates its decision-making, which in turn manifests in the course and programmes it has to offer. 
Therefore, my study does not only interrogate the history of physical education as a discipline in nascent science, but it seeks to complement this history by analyzing larger institutional and social political transitions. So, in considering the development of physical education from its origins as a postgraduate certificate course in 1935 and 1936, even into 1937, to its present status as the Division for Sports Science, my research traces disciplinary shifts within the social political context we've established this. So, therefore, let's trace the department's transitions or progressions over the course of eight decades. Let's do that together, shall we? Salimaj University was the first university in Africa to introduce a dedicated physical education course in 1936. In outlining the department's intended purpose, the first head of physical education, Dr. Ernest Franz Jokel, who was a registered medical doctor and physical education specialist, stated that the core aim of this new department was to establish Stellenbosch University as the recognized center for scientific physical education in South Africa. Born in Germany, Jokel and his wife Erika Jokel fled to South Africa after the Nazi party came into power due to his Jewish ancestry. Renowned for his work as a physical education specialist, Jokel was recruited for the position at Stellenbosch University. Apart from designing a program to train teachers who sought to specialize in physical education, Yoko hosted afternoon fitness classes on the Kutzenberg sports field for the university staff and student body. These Jokel sessions and um, I think alumni of this university is familiar with the term Jokel sessions proved to be a popular attraction on campus during crowds of 200 to 300 students and staff members, among them even the then rector Raymond William Wilcox. Jokel's contributions to the institutionalization of physical education at the university proved to be so noteworthy that the neologism yokel, meaning to exercise, was used to, re to refer to physical education courses even long after Jokel's departure. Despite playing such a pivotal role at the university, Jokel's tenure was abruptly terminated a mere nine months into his new job. His dismissal followed the controversy surrounding the methods he employed in the obligatory medical examinations of physical education students. The main cause for this controversy that led to Jokel's dismissal was the fact that he had examined women students in what the university records term as various states of undress, which transgress the traditionalist values of the university and, by extension, the Afrikaner folk it represented. Salimash University's conservative ethos informed its vision for physical education, for the physical education department, and also informed the university's stance with regard to Yoko. Operating within a larger network of burgeoning Afrikaans medium universities across the country, Stellenbosch University served as both home of and leader in Afrikaner intellectual culture and nascent nationalism. Within this context, my research examines the extent to which Afrikaner ideals, particularly with regard to gender, were ingrained in physical education. Thus, Whilst acknowledging that the racialized body was centralized in the discipline from its conception, ideologies regarding the gendered body were fundamental to the foundations of this discipline. These are most evident in its curricular structure, which dictated a division, a gendered division between the physical training of men and women students. In considering this, my research argues that in positioning gender as a key component, the discipline was inherently structured to cater to the idealized realities of the white, largely Afrikaans-speaking student body. After all, it should be emphasized that, the physical, that physical education was introduced at Stellenbosch University shortly after the release of the 1932 Carnegie Commission report on the poor white problem in South Africa. Presented as a physically and mentally unfit subset of the white society, the five-volume Poor White Problem not only reported on the state of the poverty-stricken, largely rural white population, but it forged a plan to redeem them. In essence, my study argues that while the introduction of physical education was intended to signify a move towards modern scientific explorations within the university, the maintenance of the institution's traditionalist values and its determination to propagate a certain ideal African citizen remained at the forefront of the university's concerns. Following Jokel's very swift dismissal, 
Senate instructed the Executive and Appointments Committee to secure the appointment of a new senior lecturer of physical education in June 1937. I should note that Yokel was dismissed in April 1937, but by June 1937, the university was really trying to find his replacement. By August of that year, the committee recommended the appointment of Austrian-born medical doctor and physical educationist Dr. Anton Max Karl Ovalzer for the position of senior lecturer. In addressing what was considered to be the dismal state of health among white South Africans, Ovalzer ascribed to the widely held notion that urbanization was a direct cause for societal decline in South Africa particularly amongst the largely agricultural-based Afrikaner population. Considering this, Ovals argued that the introduction of a standardized syllabus targeted at improving the nation's health has to consider a nation's history, its traditions, and its values. This system was invested in the redemption of the impoverished and destitute white population. By extension, in catering for this very specific subset of the white population, Stellenbosch University was even more deeply invested in improving the corporate and individual state of the white Afrikaner body. In formulating a standardized curriculum, Obelza advocated for the construction of a German-South African hybrid. Moreover, within the context of the university's sports performance, Obelza argued that up until 1938, the caliber of athletics and sport at Stellenbosch University had been on a noticeable decline. As a result, he suggested the introduction of a German-inspired program targeted at youth development. He argued that this would be the most beneficial approach for the university and the country at large. Obelza argued that physical education focused on youth training was essential in all modern countries and, comment and commented that the ever-increasing contact with Europe would have a positive impact on the standardization movement in South Africa. More specifically, Obelza deemed the deep-seated connections between Germany, Stellenbosch University and Afrikaner nationalism as an essential move towards progress. All that said, within two years of Obels's arrival at Stellenbosch University, Senate had put forth a motion to promote him to professor. Despite Obels's promising future at the university, his tenure was abruptly suspended. Again, exactly. <laughs> Following the outbreak of World War II, Ovals and, and his assistant Oscar Gnetz were interned in December 1939 on suspicion of Nazi-related activities. <laughs> Despite his sudden detention, Ovals' work in the department pushed Stalemush to the center of the physical education discourse in South Africa. In championing for the restoration of what he termed Afrikaner glory, Afrikaner glory, physical education at Stalemush University under the leadership of Ovals, continued to be a matter of national interest. By September 1939, the impact of World War II reached even the far frontiers of the Stellenbosch University Physical Education Department. The internment of Ovalza and Oskar Gnetz forced the university into a hasty search for a suitable candidate to assume the position of departmental chair. Through Ovalza's international networks, Johann Willem Fosma was earmarked for the position um, as acting chair from March 1940. Unlike his predecessors, Yoko and Obolza, um, Posma did not have a medical background uh, or advanced training in the field of physical education. Despite this, in becoming the first person to obtain a master's and doctoral qualification in physical education at the university, the beginnings of Posma's career was incubated during his tenure as acting chair of the department between 1940 and 1946. As 1940 marked the year in which physical education received or officially received its independent departmental status, I argue that during Posma's tenure, the newly minted department was set on defining and developing physical education as an applied science. My study contends that while um, physical educationists such as Johann Posma were struggling for a complete scientific turn, this was not attainable in practice. 
as physical education remained grounded in youth and childhood development, as well as the ideas surrounding the social advancement of the white South African population, the reconfiguration of physical education as a complete science proved to be impossible. In considering this, my research argues as a means through which to push the discipline towards science, scientific rhetoric was employed in the conceptualization of a theoretical base for physical education. So, Dr. Daniel Dani Hartman Craven took over from Johan Posma as acting chair of the physical education department at the beginning of 1946. Craven would become the first South African to be appointed to this position, as well as the first full professor of physical education at Stellenbosch University. Beyond his career as an academic, Craven is considered to be a Stellenbosch University icon, showered in accolades and enshrouded in legend. Apart from his long-standing affiliations with the university, Craven had an expansive career as a prominent Springbok rugby captain, member of the Union Defence Force and physical educationist. In examining the history of physical education and sport at Stellenbosch University, Craven's persona dominates much of the discourse. Memorialized in song, myth and the very architectural fabric of this university, Craven's legacy looms large in Stellenbosch. Indeed, his name is so deeply entrenched in the history of this university that its rugby stadium is named in his honor and a statue of Craven with a rugby ball in hand accompanied by his dog Bluxem was erected on the Kutzenberg sports field in tribute. Even the dog is memorialized as goes as in the In addressing Craven's legacy at Stellenbosch University, Paul Dobson states, and I quote, Craven, Stellenbosch and rugby formed a trinity in the minds of many, end quote. Craven's connections to Stellenbosch University was initiated in 1929. Arriving in Stellenbosch just over a decade following the university's establishment, Craven's prowess on the rugby field preceded him. With regard to the university itself, the late, by the late 1920s, the institution's reputation as the Athens of the South an environment marked by scenic views and a unique student culture had already, had already firmly taken root. Moreover, from its inception in 1980, Stellenbosch University had established a close affiliation to the emerging Afrikaner nation-building efforts of the early 20th century, which stood in contrast to the ethos of the university's local counterpart, the University of Cape Town, which reflected more of a British-aligned imperial ambiance. Um, this is also inserts taken from the centenary book. Do read the centenary book. It's very interesting. <laughs> this was the social political context in which Craven initiated his academic and professional sports careers. And this would become the very environment to bolster his legacy. In 1941, Craven served as the commanding officer for the training, the physical training battalion at Fort Rickert as discussed by Craven, the PTB admitted boys from the age of 18 who displayed what he termed remedial bodily defects and functioned to transform them into useful citizens. In undertaking the task of instilling and developing fitness, the PTB was determined to ensure that these boys would not become liabilities to the state. Moreover, as the conceptualization of fitness extended beyond the physical, the PTB was focused on character development, which would allow these boys to, and I quote this from Craven, better their chances in life by increasing their intellectual capabilities, attaining better grades in school and higher certificates, as well as developing their cognitive awareness, alertness, and self-confidence through the military training they received, end quote. According to Craven, these desired results was attainable through the implementation of the PTB's four pillars, which were focused on remedial training, education, military training, and character development. At its core, the mission of the PTB was based on redemption and the use of physical education as a remedy to ensure the holistic fitness of the body. These ideas surrounding the use of physical education as a, as a remedy were largely response to the state of public health in the early to mid 20th century. 
This in turn imbued physical education theory and practice at Stellenbosch University with a medicalized focus. The framing of physical education as remedy did not exist in isolation as it sought to serve in support of a nationally focused objective to improve the physical condition of the South African citizen. More specifically, the standardization of South African physical education in the early 20th century was a means to the which to make and mold the ideal citizen. As discussed, physical education programs and courses um, that were, la uh, were launched as part of a national plan, as I said, to redeem a fallen subset of the white population. Beyond the physical development of white South Africans, a short insert included in the second edition of Salimbosch University-based journal La Food and Physical Education presented the objectives for physical education programs for black South Africans. The intervention plan position to address the state of health among black South Africans should be analyzed as a byproduct of a white-centered physical education movement. This interpretation is evidencing the overt civilizing rhetoric rampant within the discourse surrounding physical education for black South Africans, as the text reads, um, and I quote, the tremendous revival of physical education, which is now current to improve white South Africa, also visibly touch the native. Without a doubt, these advanced measures are able to improve the exceptionally poor health conditions of the natives, especially those who live in cities. It is desirable that the spare time of the native should be filled with organized games such as football and not stick fighting, end quote. In considering this broader social context, many physical educationists, Craven included, advocated for the standardization and medicalization of physical education as a remedy to improve society. As seen in the case of the PTB, physical education could be used as a means to address, to address both individual and what they consider to be social ills. The mid-1970s witnessed transitions in terms of departmental leadership. After serving as department chair for almost three decades, Craven retired in 1975 and took on the responsibilities of director of sport and recreation at the university on a full-time basis. From 1976, um, physiologists Professor Baron Friedrich Frickitiriat, I struggle with that name, assumed the position of department chair. Tiat's appointment coincided with the discipline's move towards the centralization of applied science, both within the department and on a national scale. Within this expanded focus on the, inst the institutionalization of an applied scientific base, the field began taking shape and was more consciously redefined as a discipline that examined the effects of sport, movement, and related factors on the human body and overall physical performance. Moreover, while the appointment of a trained physiologist as head of department reflected broader disciplinary shifts, um, physical, physical education's original nationalist-driven ambitions still remained central. Raising the state of the nation's health had always been at the core of this discipline. As argued by prominent physical educationists in the context of the standardization period in the 1930s and the 1940s, the best way to improve a nation's health was through its youth. For Tiart, physical education, sport and recreation played an important role in improving the nation's health. He contended that, that a means through which to address the nation's health crisis was through the education of school-aged children with regard to overall health and nutrition. While his statement echoes earlier discussions surrounding the nation's ailing health, there alludes to contemporary issues that had not been prominent, that not, had not been as prominent in the early to mid-20th century regarding the pulpus of this discipline. In this, he not only raises the concerns surrounding um, nutrition and physical activity, he highlights the effects of smoking and drug use during this period. Moreover, he emphasizes the fact that the, department, ex the department's expanded focus facilitated a move beyond the teacher training focus. With youth development still at the core of this field, Tiat 
called for a collaboration with other medical fields and in turn foregrounded new areas of specialization that students could pursue. In accounting for the discipline's overall progression, the expansion of physical education that encompassed sport and recreation allowed for an extension of the discipline's social impact. This in turn gave rise to an increased focus on the ways in which physical education um, was to be employed as an instrument of the apartheid state. In considering the broader apartheid context of the 1970s, public participation in state-funded and um, state-funded physical education and sports development programs largely catered for a privileged segment of the population with the masses effectively marginalized and relegated to the peripheries. Furthermore, for the apartheid state, the introduction and advancement of physical education as a school subject from the early 20th century served as a tool to further the ideological agenda of the segregations and apartheid governments. As physical education was employed, and I'm quoting this from a study, um, a um, recent sports science study, to encourage a v- vigilant white militarism that prepared white South African boys against the total onslaught waged by the black majority and communists. End quote. As seen in preceding decades, physical education in the 1970s remained invested in nationalism. However, to a far greater extent than before, the discipline was employed as a means to not only optimize physical performance in the state of health, but militarize a generation that would in turn aid in the protection and preservation of an oppressive state. From 2019, Stellenbosch University Sports Science Department officially formed part of the medical faculty. In attempting to make sense of sports science rise to prominence um, over physical education, it is imperative to consider the context of the 1990s. Yep. Two core factors serve as compelling motivators behind the centralization of sport over physical education, namely the phasing out of physical education as a standalone subject from 1994, and second, South Africa's readmission into the international sports arena. First, with regard to the status of physical education in the South African school system, Karl van Dievender, an associate professor in the Stellenbosch University Sports Science Department, holds that Within the post-1994 context, physical education's integration into life orientation and life skills not only affected the expansion of the discipline, but it had a negative effect on the nation's health. In considering the rise of the new nation building of the 1990s, a central objective of the ANC government was its mission to undo the injustices and social disparities called by, caused by the apartheid regime. Physical education had a close connection to the vision of the apartheid state. Thus, decentering a subject that was so intimately aligned with militarism, racism, and gender consciousness was a means through which to emphasize the vision for a new nation one based on reconciliation, inclusivity, and equality. Introduced as umbrella subjects, life orientation and life skills has a strong personal development, social justice, and equity focus that had been constructed within the ideological parameters of the the post-1994 state. Within the context of the new South Africa, the democratic regime did not consider physical education as a matter of national concern as a, in the same way as before. This does not, however, mean that physical education in the post-1994 context was devoid of nationalist undertones. While the ethos of the post-apartheid government shifted its focus away from compulsory physical education as a means to breed a stronger, healthier nation, now national sports pride has emerged as a core driving force behind nationalism. Following South Africa's readmission into the international sport arena, the sporting mega event now serves as a means through which to forge the foundations of a new nation. Hence why I included this image over here from the 1995 um, Rugby World Cup. While the commercialization of sport had 
risen to prominence since the mid um, 20th century, researchers in the field of um, sports science note that the national approach which dictated a move away from compulsory physical education stands in stark contrast with international trends, as physical education still receives primary focus in many nations. Within the apartheid context, the South African sports policy was a direct reflection of a political system that was based on systematic exclusion of the black population from full membership in all that society's institutions, including sport. In considering the impact of political transformations, the nation's pathway to democracy allowed for the readmission into international sport from 1991. This new political dispensation granted South African athletes the opportunity to compete on a global stage, which in turn gave rise to commercial opportunities both internationally and locally. So, in the age of sports science, the disciplinary objective of the field largely occupies itself with issues regarding evaluation, testing, and indeed the optimization of the human body. In tracing the discipline's development as well as its scientific obses obsessions, my research draws on the 2019 Sports Science article as a lens to investigate intellectual and ethical blind spots embedded within this discipline. In attempting to unpack the disciplinary practices that gave rise to race-based research in physical education and sports science, my study demonstrated the ways in which essentialist notions pertaining to race and gender were etched into the construction of this discipline. The existence of the 2019 study at Stellenbosch University echoes the institution's decades-long research-based fixation with the study of race and race science. In consolidating the discipline's intellectual history with university-wide research legacies, I illustrate how research for a study such as the March 2019 paper came into fruition. At its core, my research serves to or sought to prove that the 2019 paper was neither a rupture nor an anomaly. Instead, the article presents the extent to which categories such as race and gender had and continues to be employed as fixed, immovable markers that dictate and limit an individual's capacity. Thank you. And now, uh, Dr. Durries, <laughs> shall I say, I really enjoy calling you that. Uh, thank you for this not only fascinating talk, but, but really compelling presentation. And the whole time I was listening, I was thinking, what is the English translation for to hang an immense lipper? Well, I was absolutely hanging on the lips there then. Um, and in thinking about your work, I am reminded always that so I was trained in anthropology. And so, of course, I'm going to use that as my point of reference. But I'm reminded of Laura Nader's call in 1972 to study up, essentially. And this came within the context of the post-colonial critique. And what she said is that, well, at that time, anthropology was exercised within a particular set of power relations. That means the marginalized and the poor and the other. And Laura later argued, we need to extend our field of study. Uh, she says, we need to study the process whereby power and responsibility are exercised. She said, we need to study those who shape attitudes and control institutional structures. And so I quote here, she said, what if in reinventing anthropology, anthropologists were to study the colonizers rather than the colonized, the culture of power rather than the culture of the powerless, the culture of affluence rather than the culture of poverty. And I think in some way you have responded to a call, not in terms of an ethnography, anthropological research, but equally important in terms of a historical study of one particular department at this university, albeit with many names over the years, and to make legible the power structures within that department, within this institution, and how it related to an Afrikaner nationalist movement, uh, forms of nation-making, citizen-making in terms of the white Afrikaner body 
And so I admire you for it, first of all. And, and I think we need to take up this call to do more. I mean, this is one department. I, I would extend that ball to more people to study our own institutions. We're both PhD products of Stellenbosch University. And, and I think we, we both find um, incredible importance in making that contribution at the place where we find ourselves. Furthermore, by laying bare this power, we also lay bare the things we carry with us. Uh, so clearly stated, the 2019 study, Colored Woman Study, for sure, was the inspiration for, for your, your study. And I am reminded of uh, William Faulkner's famous phrase, the past is never dead. It's never even past. And so I'm wondering, um, shall we start there? Just a reflection from your side on your study. And I guess I'm going to embed a question in here. You've provided an entire history of a department where the white subject was, was often the white African speaking uh, body was quite often the subject, especially in the, in the early years in terms of uh, rehabilitation in the context of the poor white question. But I was wondering if that ever shifted during, during the history of this department, uh, if the focus of the subject shift, shifted on which subject and when that occurred, um, and if that occurred, and to maybe, if you can broadly frame an arc for what that happened and how we ended up at the Hundred Women Study of 2019. In answering your question, I think I need to look at the intention of the department. This department was not for Kokata. They were not establishing the other. They were perfecting this white Afrikaner body. The intention of the study was just that. It was the perfecting of the white Afrikaner body. Hence why um, those who were admitted into the first courses were um, qualified teachers who went to sort to teach physical education to white students, which came on the deals of the, um, I think there was a, 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 a teacher's, a teacher's um, conference that called for standardized or obligatory physical education in schools. And Stellenbosch University responds to that call by creating a physical education course. Um, I mentioned it in my talk that this physical education movement was a white-centered one. And um, physical education for the majority of this country was deemed to be a byproduct of this movement. Hence why if I go through uh, the university's first physical education journals, there is short, very short inserts, and I can't think that of me finding more than five in all these journals' iterations that it refers to physical education for what was termed non-white subjects. The one that I wrote is the only one I could find. So this focus on establishing the other was never the intention of this department. It was about perfecting the ideal of an citizen. Um, studies on um, the state of physical education, the state of health in other communities, that was always evident, yes. But on a, before, on a disciplinary side, I couldn't find the same effort being made. But in terms of the um, presence of this 2019 study, that was evident in identifying the other because there were articles from um, the Physical Education Journal as well as the After Vigor. So that was a trend, but it was never the core focus of this department. I'm going to jump around because you know I'm fascinated by your word and <laughs> junk. <laughs> so you make a, a, a clear link here with you know, political ideology and Afrikaner nationalist movement and a science practice at this institution, um, which we know was replicated in other disciplines as well, uh, specifically following the establishment of, of the university um, after 1918 and, and those early years, the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, um, where we saw in, in various iterations um, a, f a disciplinary focus on the Afrikaner folk. I am quite interested in the 1936-1937 moment with your call. Um, what we have at Stellenbosch at that time, uh, from, from what I know, is a, a complicated politics, uh, the rise of an Afrikaner nationalist movement, 
um, strong supporters in professorial positions at this university. And in 1936, uh, and we have a, a, a crisis of Jewish refugees uh, with what is happening in Germany, a, a place where many of our professors were trained in the 20s, early 30s. Um, and so with Jewish refugees arriving in South Africa, we have five professors from this university in 1936 uh, protesting virulently <laughs> against the arrival of Jews in South Africa and the concern of the imprint that these people have on the local communities in which they settle. And so it's during this time that physical education is established at Stellenbosch and Yorkel is, is appointed. A Jewish man, uh, now appointed at Stellenbosch University, short tenure, but was there, in your research, was there anything that spoke to these political tensions um, in in terms of Yoko's position here and the fact that, that he left quite mm. early after. Okay, firstly, thank you for the question, because I do love speaking with Yoko. Mm. All the my history peers know I love speaking with Yoko. Um, firstly, official records don't indicate anything pertaining to Yoko's Jewish identity. But I found a um, student publication that discusses Yoko's Jewish identity, which argues that race should not be the reason why it's dismissed because the university was aware of his Jewish ancestry when they appointed him. Um, so um, Yoko was essentially appointed by Wilcox. Professor Ebi Stegman was really influential in appointing, was a mathematician at the university and former Springbok rugby player. So he was appointed, he was recruited specifically for this position. But Yoko in the archive is such a shadow figure. He's there, but he's also not there. His name is everywhere. If you go into the um, centenary exhibition in the museum, you see his name everywhere. And even when I was doing research on the history of physical education and Lichams of Fudan, the first thing people, oh, you're doing something on B.R. Yoko. So I said, yeah, so who is this figure? So the university, um, on the side of the university, Wilcox and Stephman, my research indicated they were aware of his Jewish ancestry, but he never led with his Jewish ancestry. Um, people, figures like um, Francois Cleofas would argue that he was fired because of his Jewish ancestry. It's in, essentially, it was anti-Semitism. But no, the Senate minutes don't indicate. People like Professor Stegman voted in the minority to keep him at the institution. Um, Wilcox, which is another shadow figure at this university, was quite on the side of keeping the university's hands clean. However, his, his Jewish identity was never a hidden aspect of himself. However, when it came to his dismissal, I would argue that it was, it was certainly on the ground to the fact that he was conducting medical examinations on women students. And it freaked everybody out. The church writes a letter to the university in which they um, argue that the Siedelika Valsaid finds Dama Studenta. So they speak about the moral well-being of the woman students. So it was a reaction to what he was doing, not his identity. That is what the university records indicate. And even that publication that speaks about what was happening on the ground, because um, there's a De Berger article around the same time where students came out to the student recreational to support your goal. So I think very much his Jewish identity was not as big an issue, which makes it is quite strange for the time. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that it isn't. It really is very strange for the time. Um, but yeah, that's something I am thinking about in the role of something I'm I think that's a I mean, that's a really useful contribution that you're making because it complicates the politics at Stellenbosch. And I think, I think it's important to do that, uh, specifically in the, the late 1930s, early 1940s, when you have the rise of the Osevar Brandfach. Mm -hmm. And some, some members, I mean, it started as a cultural organization and it turned into something a bit more far right. But to see this university as not one thing, that definitely there was a, yeah. a pro-German sentiment among some people. Um, others framed it as anti-British. Um, I also recently stumbled upon an article, I should share this with you, um, in the early 40s, I think it was about 12 professors who wrote against fascism as they saw it emerging here. Yeah. Um, it was in uh, Rector H.B. Tom's collection um, and the university responded by saying that they don't agree with these 
with these 12 professors who wrote against fascism, but definitely that there was a contentious politics. Um, and I think it's, it's important to highlight that. So from your call and his Jewishness, we go to Orpolzer, who's in turn for Nazi-related activities. So I want to stick around that time period. And, and what you presented here today, I think it is German connections came to the fore more clearly for me. But in terms of the internment, uh, do you have any information that you want to share around what those Nazi-related activities was, whether it was a political ideology or whether it was part of a rounding up of German citizens at, at that time in South Africa as the war broke out? The latter, yes, um, because when his notes were confiscated, so there aren't any records of what these Nazi-related activities were. But he was overtly right-wing. <laughs> it was okay. very overt. But what about his writing? Because he wrote in, uh, I think in 1938, there's a Eiskenwood article where he speaks about first seeing uh, Springbok plays for the first time. So he's like, I'll, I'll translate it now and say, Celis was sterks as ossa and brain gebrand in his stone, by who are strong as oxen in bronze by the sun. So in that article, he writes about the fact that a German-inspired physical education uh, phys physical education system is needed in order to fix South Africa. And he also emphasizes the fact that the connections that the university had already established with Germany was essential for the move towards progress. So I think it was part of a rounding up of what was considered to be aligned with Nazi politics. Uh, but also his sentiments were quite overt in his writings at the time. Um, so what I'm driving at here is a scientist with a clear political ideology and that it speaks in their, in their work. It is legible. But this is followed by Korsmark Craven etc. So the early years around these individuals who contribute to the formation of physical education at Stellenbosch. Um, and I'm wondering about Osman Kreben, whether you found that political ideology spoke very clearly in their work um, or whether it was affiliations with, with political organizations or anything that you can speak of. Of course. What? Hosma was more absorbed into Afrikaner culture. I feel he wasn't um, both Yokel and um, Ovalza were from, but they were German, but Ovalza was, and I think he came from the Netherlands. So he was more easily absorbed into this culture, but I didn't see any political, overt political affiliations in his work. Um, hence why that chapter of my thesis was personally incredibly difficult to, to write. But also on the other hand, I, I looked at what he was doing. He was interested in pushing physical education towards science. I didn't see this, uh, call for return to African of glory that um, Obozo was speaking about. I didn't I didn't see that as much. Even in the work of Yokel, he speaks about the race. He terms um he speaks about physical education for the native. I don't see that work. I didn't see that in Postma's work. And Craven Craven it was also a very difficult chapter to write in the sense that I don't feel as though he was as an active member of that department. I think the women of that department were running the show. It was Isabella Nell and um, Edith Katzenelenbogen, who was evident in that department and pushing the study towards kinesiology. Um, I do feel like uh, Craven was on the rugby field more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. You know, what I find so fascinating about your approach, probably both of you, is just the layers and layers and layers just unearthing this history to arrive at this point, why the interest in the black body. I find that so fascinating. And in a way, it gets us to the point of complexity that you're raising, that in, in, in this unearthing, this journey of just looking at this in a kind of a Foucauldian way, that you're really getting into where are the origins of this power that this institution has or, or, or that apartheid has had rather at the time? But then also what's interesting is the issue of complexity that they are the Jews, the Nazis, you know. And so if you think about the present moment, there is the urinator, there is at the same time a commitment by management to really engage in change. And I wonder what just bringing your, the trajectory of your work to the current moment, I wonder what, what's on your mind about just this 
this institution that is so complex that we see the you know both this history the legacies of this history but we see at the same time almost like a, a contemporary reflective <laughs> engagement with this history is that how you, you might interpret the complexity um depending on my research i see the institution as a loving organism one that is ever changing deeply deeply complicated okay incredibly flawed at times um my issue in many instances with southern bosch university's approaches to these incidents it's it's why like that i like that jonathan jansen got i'm surprised that you're surprised it's it's that level of shock when yeah. things happen think about your institution's history Speak about you, not to remind yourself of your shortcomings, mm -hmm. but to address it in a meaningful, deep manner. A deep intervention is needed for this, because mm -hmm. otherwise we just replicate institutional culture mm -hmm. with a different face every time. Mm -hmm. The need for um, this kind of intervention and using history, because um, mm -hmm. I, I will always call to history, no, no, using history as a means, as a lens through which to address the contemporary moment is mm -hmm. essential mm -hmm. because we can then say that these aren't ruptures. Yeah. We can then say, like my previous work argues, that decolonial turns has been happening since the 70s. It's, it's not new. And we need disciplines, even uh, we need these disciplines, our disciplines to address these ongoing issues or else they will remain ongoing issues. Neither rupture nor anomaly. I love that line. Do you want to say something to that? I feel like it's hard to, to go after that. I agree. No, I absolutely agree. And that and that we're having this conversation, in fact, that's that as a as a result of your work, we are having this conversation. We are sort of speaking about this issue, the need to to address at this level and to look at history so that it's not seen as you know, this is a surprise. But what do we do then, given that deep rooted in the culture and the history as you unearth it? Um, that was a fascinating paper. Thank you. Um, well, on Scott Spurlock, oh. this is kind of a sidebar question, but it, I'm interested in um, religion and culture and the form of identity. Um, and Hugh McLeod's talked about muscular Christianity yes. as a way of you know formulating identity. I wonder what kind of religious rhetoric might have been at work uh, in uh, uh, kind of internal institutional discourses. Um, I did not have the time to include that conversation in this presentation, but I do deal with it quite extensively in my work. Um, religion is essential from the start of this discipline and I, I see it more overtly. Yoko's tenure was way too short to do anything of meaningful but obols are certainly so. Um, there's this moment in 1939 where this um, rise of Afrikaan glory um, coincides with the um, Oortrekker um, centenary, trek centenary and it's celebrated in near religious terms which is the words of Professor. Professor Quindlin, in near religious terms, it's 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 celebrated like that, and that imbues physical education in Lachams of Puddin. So certainly, religion plays an essential because uh, an essential part because what are we perfecting to? We are perfecting to this um, Christian centric image of what perfection essentially is. So yes. I thought it was interesting, this story of dismissal of this professor because of this Nazi connection. And yet, I mean, this whole, what did you call it? PTV, physical education as remedy. And yet embedded within that, actually, are strongly in mean, the idea that you can't have, you know, uh, weak bodies. Mm -hmm. You can't have bodies that are damaged. It's very much connected to the Nazi ethos, and that they were judging this person for their roots to Nazism and expelling them when actually, even within inherent in the whole practice of this physical education outlook, was very much about perfecting the white body, you know, to the exclusion of the black body, as you say, that it was about. It was not about otherness, but in a way, it is about it's an exclusion of the other, you know, and the focus on the on on building the white body, which has roots to the perfect Aryan race. I wonder how isn't there a contradiction there in the way that this was set out, or I suppose it reflects the complexities again. I wouldn't say it's a 
you mm-hmm. know, form the foundations of this discipline. Yeah, of uh, course, the work of um, of Obolza. Obolza and his youth form part of the Banden Fuchel organization, of which many of the participants in this organization end up becoming Nazis themselves. Yeah, um, so, and that was the type of physical education that he was bringing here in 1937. Apart from that, the Danish physical educa- uh, education as Niels Buk. Um, informed physical education in South Africa, where uh, Yoko eventually went off to one work in Fitz and he became like really important in South Africa. Yeah. So essentially, mm-hmm. or initially, uh, British physical education, that system was going to inform physical education in South Africa, which largely deals on muscular Christianity. But um, South African politics was skewing towards a more German-centered ethos, so they realized that this is not going to work, and they adopted the physical education practices of Niels Buk, who was a Nazi sympathizer, and that perfecting of the body, that um, display of what um, the perfect body was mm-hmm. supposed to be, informed the foundations of physical education on a national and on a local level with mm-hmm. South African University. It should also be noted that... Um, only two formerly English medium institutions had physical education course was a Rhodes and Wits University. Mm-hmm. The rest was all Afrikaans medium university. So that is also quite telling about what physical education courses was. Thank you for listening to this podcast. For more, you can check out our website. <laughs>